All right, good evening, it's five o'clock. Uh, call to order for James City County Wetlands Board. Can I have a roll call, please? Mr. Roadley? Here. Mr. Waltrip? Here. Mr. O'Brien? Mr. Lukens? Here. Mr. Dunn? Here. All right, the purpose of the the board is the responsibility of this board is to carry out locally the Commonwealth policy to preserve the wetlands and to accommodate the economic activity so as to prevent their despoliation. Everyone had an opportunity to review the minutes from the June 8th regular board meeting. Are there any changes, amendments? The minutes are accepted. Or correction, motion to approve the minutes from the June 8th 2022 so meeting as presented. Thank you. Second. Good afternoon, board. Um, Trevor Long, James City County Watershed Planner. Just want to let you know uh, that there are only four members of the board present here tonight. It does take three affirmative votes to pass a motion. Um, so just wanted to use this time um, as a reminder uh, that there should be three affirmative votes, and uh, to keep that in mind throughout the evening. Thank you. Thank you for the public hearings. The outline for tonight uh, includes staff presentations, followed by any questions or clarifications from the board. Then the public hearing will be opened. At that time, anybody wishing to speak may do so once called upon by the chair. All public speakers must state their name and address for the record. After everyone wishing to speak have done so, the public hearing will be closed and discussion amongst the board will start. The first public hearing, WJPA 22-0015 for 258 Sandy Bay Road. Afternoon, Mr. Chair, members of the board. Trevor Long, Jim City County Watershed Planner, here to present WJPA-22-0015 at 258 Sandy Bay Road. Ms. Carla Havens of Mid-Atlantic Resource Consulting has applied for a wetlands permit on behalf of Mr. Kenneth Goldsmith and Ms. Ashley Overman Goldsmith for the construction of a vinyl bulkhead with a stoner turn and stone revetment on property located at 258 Sandy Bay Road within the Powhatan Creek watershed. Uh, on the screen above, you can see this parcel uh, outlined here in blue. Again, this is within the Powhatan Creek watershed. The parcel is quite large, so the purpose of this uh, presentation, we've zoomed, zoomed in on the project um, area for the most part. The body of water here is Powhatan Creek. Um, and the area right along here on the property line is where the applicants are proposing uh, the shoreline stabilization project. Existing conditions of this property include a gradually sloping bank, which you can see here on the topography map. Uh, for the most part, it is uh, decently flat. However, it does start to slope back towards the water, and they, that is the area of which they are starting to experience um, sloughing, erosion, and a shoreline failure. Coyer logs were installed to address shoreline erosion on this bank uh, in previous years, um, and now the applicants are proposing to install a 75 linear foot bulkhead with a query stone return. On the other side of the boat lift, which you can see here on the screen above, the applicants are proposing um, to construct a 12 linear foot query stone revetment. As you can see, um, the entirety of this portion of the project is within the RPA. I uh, wanted to put this up um, for a later discussion um, and the floodplain as it affects this property. So the portion of this project will be installed within the floodplain of which base elevation um, was determined at seven feet. The applicants conversed with the county and the Virginia Marine Resource Commission, which is VMRC, regarding the use of a non-living shoreline stabilization approach. Because of the proximity of the bank to the existing house and the narrowness of the channel, all parties involved agreed that a living shoreline would not be appropriate solution for this property. 
The applicant has also expressed concern that the bank was too steep for a living shoreline on this property. Um, the above site plan indicates uh, the areas of which um, the shoreline stabilization is proposed. This is the revetment that I was talking about. This area here is the, um, the boat ramp and also the dock. Mean high water is outlined here in blue, with mean low water being proposed uh, seaward. The stone return coming directly off of the bulkhead, the proposed bulkhead, uh, outlined on the northern part of this property, also here in yellow. A cross section of this bulkhead and also revetment. And some site photographs. Uh, this area shown on the screen above, um, looking out towards where the bulkhead will be and the return. Uh, looking back um, in this region, you will also see uh, the area which they're proposing a bulkhead. The boat lift and dock in the background. Some stakes here taking a later date indicating the approximate location of said bulkhead. As published in the Virginia Register on July 11, 2005, the revised wetland mitigation compensation policy and supplemental guidelines regulation 4VAC 20-390-10, Virginia as a Chesapeake Bay program partner is committed to achieve a no net loss of existing wetlands acreage and function in the signatory's regulatory programs. In order for a proposed project to be authorized to impact wetlands and compensate for the wetland loss in some prescribed manner, the following three criteria must be met. All reasonable mitigative efforts, including alternative siting, which would eliminate or minimize wetland loss or disturbance, must be incorporated in the proposal. The proposal must clearly be water dependent in nature. The proposal must demonstrate clearly its need to be in the wetlands and its overwhelming public and private benefits. And if the, if the proposed project cannot meet one or more of the above criteria, the project must be denied or must occur in areas outside of wetlands. Should it satisfy all three criteria, compensation for the wetland loss is required. The subsequent, uh, the sequence of application, acceptable mitigation options should be as follows, on site, off-site within the same watershed, mitigation banks in the same watershed, or a payment of an in-lieu fee. If compensation is required, it should be a condition of this permit. Staff has reviewed this application and finds that this project meets the three criteria outlined above. While there are no vegetated wetland impacts proposed in this application, the site currently lacks a riparian buffer and adequate construction access. Uh, this construction access will occur through the RPA. As such, the applicants have agreed to restore a 10-foot riparian buffer along the proposed bulkhead with bunch grasses. Staff has reviewed the above application and recommends approval of the application as presented. Should the board wish to approve the application, staff suggests the following conditions be incorporated into the approval. The applicant must obtain all other necessary local, state, and federal permits. All development activities located in the special flood hazard area shall comply with Article 6, Division 3, Floodplain Area Regulations of the James City County Zoning Ordinance and receive all required approval and permits prior to the commencement of such activities. The installation of 50 bunch grasses be planted and mulched in the riparian buffer. A surety of $500 be paid to guarantee the, uh, the plantings that this wetlands permit for this project shall expire on September 14th, 2025 if construction has not begun and if an extension of this permit is needed, a written request must be submitted to the Stormwater and Resource Protection Division no later than August 1st, 2025, which is six weeks prior to the expiration date of this permit. Thank you very much. I would be happy to answer any questions the board may have. Is there going to be any dredging done, or is it bulkhead, just be a bulkhead? To my knowledge, is just the bulkhead. However, is there a reason why they didn't use a revetment approach as opposed to a bulkhead? Um, 
I will let, I'll defer that question to the applicant. Allow them to speak on that matter. Did I hear you correctly? You said there was no vegetative impact? Uh, that is what the application has shown. Um, there is wetland vegetation within that area. Go back to the pictures, please. A little small fringe. Yes, uh, in this particular area, um, there is um, some wetland vegetation seaward of the, um, the proposed bulkhead. Um, I believe on the other side of the um, dock, which there, there is also another pocket of wetlands behind this revetment area. Kind of there at the very upper limits. Yeah. That dock is showed on there. Is that the one, is that existing or is that next door? This is the existing dock um, that is on the property. Um, I don't believe they're, if, they, they, if the applicants have proposed any um, changes to the dock, it is uh, not before this board. Change in, that, is that in their uh, agreement, what we're trying to do here, is change it? No, not, not here tonight. Um, the dock and any pier would be outside of this board's jurisdiction. How far, how far, go back on the other picture where it shows the mud flat to the right of the picture. How far does that bulkhead go past to the right, or is that the end of it where that stake is? I believe this is the area, and um, the, the contractor uh, can correct me if I am wrong. I believe this is the area where uh, the return begins. So the return would be there. Yes, and yes, sir. Back towards us, okay. Any other questions? All right, thank you. Thank you. We'll open the, the public hearing. Would anyone like to speak on this? The subject. Good evening, gentlemen. I'm Carla Havens, Mid Atlantic Resource Consulting, 1095 Cherry Row Lane, Shackelfords, 23156. Um, in the foreground, right there, is a boat ramp that was previously permitted. The stone was put down, but the paver blocks were never put down. So I just wanted in the record that that's the the paper blocks are proposed on top of this existing like base. It's, it's a stone base and they, for whatever reason, the previous property owner, the previous permittee, just never put the paver blocks on it. So that, that's part of this too. So the stones that you see horizontal to the picture frame here, that is the edge of the boat ramp that's gonna have more pavers on it. That PVC with the pink, flagging on it is the return that will go into the upland. And the bulkhead um, will be constructed away from where you're standing. You see the two oak trees to the right, in the top right of the picture. There's, if, if you were able to go to the site, um, you, you'll notice that on this end of the property, there, there's some really nice canopied oak trees. And that's part of the reason why they didn't go with the revetment, because they didn't want to lose the oak trees. Um, if you recall, on, as you go past those two oak trees, there are no other significant trees. And um, the majority of the bulkhead is behind us in this picture, correct? No. The revetment is behind you. You are standing. <coughs> all right. Um, all right. So all right, you, see, you see where my arrow is on the big red arrow on the drawing. Right here, you see me wiggling it on the drawing? Okay, so this is the footprint of the boat ramp. This photo was taken right here. That little circle is my PVC pipe right here. So the bulkhead has this return, so the return is going this way, and then the bulkhead goes this way. Thank you. 
And let me see if I can manipulate this thing. All right, here, let me go this way. So the bulkhead is going to go away from us. Now we're looking back towards the boat ramp, which is over. The, so this, this, whoops. This hump or this mound or extension of land is going to be excavated back, this upland. And the photos are a little deceiving in that you see how this is dead vegetation for the most part right here? It is, it is hanging over a lip of soil. There, there is no soil underneath this. It's just vegetation that is falling over. And there is no, there's, there's basically the, the beginnings of a mud flat under here. There's no sunlight getting in there. Super high tides, it gets wet. But th the idea is that this is going to get shaved off. And my PVC pipe is somewhere over here. And the other one is right behind me. And this whole thing, all this upland right here, is getting lopped off. And that's so that we can keep a straight line and stay behind the Peltandra and all the, the um, freshwater wetlands plants that are up there. So that's how you do, the, do this without any wet, vegetative wetlands impacts? Exactly. Exactly. Because we're going to be pulling back that overhanging. It's like a weed mat. It's uh -huh. just roots and, and just junk. Like you don't want to walk on it because it's going to give. But you just can't tell. And Trevor, where are you? I asked you to take a picture of that, remember? When we were on site? Yes. Because it was for exactly this reason. You can't tell sitting in here and looking at that picture how scoured out it is underneath the, the grasses and roots right there. And that's why we can pull it back and not impact those wetlands, the vegetated wetlands. Carla, just for clarity, I can see four PVC pipes leaning up against the bank in this picture. Those are not mine. Those are not yours. Those okay. are leftovers from the coir logs. And the um, oak stakes were out there with the twine on it as well, but the coir is long gone. Yeah, I think there's more than that. There's, what, one? That might be two, three, four. Oops, I'm really good at clicking this thing here. Um, yeah, th those are not mine. Those are just old. And then as we, all right, so now we're looking, we're on the boat ramp side of that mound of earth that I said was going to get removed. That's probably between stake one and two where the return is going to be. Yeah. And then I don't think there's a picture of where the, re of, of where the return's coming into the upland. It's, um, as you're facing the creek, it's over on the right-hand side, and there's some nice trees over there and a cypress. And um, when Wilbur was out there and we all discussed it, we didn't want to drive the sheeting into the, um, any of the knees or any of the roots. So that's why he's just going to do a short little return, and then we're going to put a revetment over on that side that can follow the contours of the shoreline without hacking into Will the roots. this be constructed thing. from upland? Yes. Oh, how... Oh. Uh, that stake that you see in the middle of that picture, how far up towards the oak trees are you going? I can't see where the, it ends on that. Is it past those bushes that I see there on the right side? Those? Yes, it will how continue. Far it, how far is it? Where does it end? Can you show me where it ends? All right, so here's the corner of the house. The bulkhead ends here, and I mean, then there's this little... Picture. Can ten you, foot return with stone can here. You show, can you show me on the, on the picture where no, it is? No, there's, there's not a picture here. So, so how far, how many feet is it from that stake past up on that mud flat are you going roughly? I think this stake in the photo is either that stake or that stake. So it's 20, if it's, if it's this stake here that I'm pointing to on the drawing, can you see where I'm pointing? It's 22 feet. Another 20 some feet past that stake, past that bush. Yes. And then you have your return. Yes. Okay. And then down on the other side of the boat ramp, where we've got that big, big oak tree that hangs over the pier, is where the revetment is because there is still an embankment there. Nothing's growing because it's under the, the pier and under the shade of the, of the tree. So that's why we figured we're going to do a, a short revetment. 
that blends up to the marsh on that side, and it's, it's barely jurisdictional. It's, it's stakes so high in the landscape. But we figured that was just going to continue to erode unless we put something there. I understand the idea to preserve the integrity of the oak trees. Um, but it looks like there's quite a bit of shoreline there that could be used with a revetment as opposed to a bulkhead. Is it just a preference for the type of structure and the use of the upland? Or I don't mean this nasty. If you go to the site, you would see a lot. And those three trees are, I mean, that's what makes their backyard. I'm not suggesting and the trees come out. But you can't do a revetment. The toe of the revetment would be so far into that section of the creek, and it, it drops. It's, it's like minus eight in the middle of, of that creek. So the, and plus it's mucky, and I, I don't know if it would create a mud wave, but a revetment's just not the thing to do around those trees. One other uh, uh, point on that topic, there are SAVs directly offshore in that area uh, that likely would, would uh, come into play if a revetment were, were to be put outwards. And um, Mr. Goldsmith is here in the audience if you have any questions or historical questions. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else who'd like to speak on this matter? Please come forward, state your name, address for the record. My name is Rachel Tidwell. Um, I am at 256 Sandy Bay Road. Um, the creek doesn't surround my house, but I know for a fact that that area of that creek, because my parents lived there uh, starting in 1963 until my dad passed away in 2001, um, the creek in that area is not very wide. Um, it's mainly used for kayakers and uh, people canoeing. Um, it's tidal water, it's brackish water. And there's one deep hole, which is where a tree fell years ago. Everything else is very shallow. Um, I don't want to, I mean, there's already a dock there. I don't want to see a boat ramp put in, not that I'll see it, but I've, I've, heard that when the goldsmiths took a John boat out, they actually got stuck on a sandbar. So I, I'm against this. Um, I, that's just the way I feel. My understanding that the boat ramp exists, it, it just has a, doesn't have an improved surface. That boat ramp has only been there about five years, so I can't understand how it would, you know, fall apart that quickly. But that tide gets very, very low in there. And a big boat cannot get up in there anymore. So I don't know what they're considering with the boat ramp, but that's the way I feel. Thank you very much. Thank you. What else? Um, as you said, Chuck, the, um, the boat ramp is there. It was a previously permitted structure and when I pulled up the old permit to get the details on what, what had been permitted, um, the drawings, I could not find anything that gave a good description or depiction of that boat ramp. Like, was it framed? Was it supposed to be framed and stone in it over filter cloth? There, there were no details like that. It was just described in the text that it was a um, paver stone boat ramp. So. That's, they want to complete that portion of the ramp. And um, Mr. Goldsmith wanted to have, make a comment as well. Sure. Hi, good evening, I'm Ken Goldsmith, 258 Sandy Bay Road. Uh, so the issue of the boat ramp, the boat ramp was there when we purchased the property, um, I think it was permitted about 2013. And uh, as Carla said, just has the stone, didn't, never had the pavers on it. Where that boat ramp goes, it's right next to the dock. That dock, you know, we put a boat in. We have no problem. We have a 14-foot John boat. We 
put that in and out, no problem there. It's plenty of water even at low tide. And at mean low water, off that dock, there's a good six feet of water right there. It's in the, starts where the creek is bending there, and that's where it gets pretty, uh, pretty deep. Um, that side of the creek is a little for that's more looking up creek up uh, stream there and that side is is mud flat the channel up there is kind of on the other side but it sweeps around the curve there and hits where our dock is um, the uh, a couple of other things um, the, the bank is really undercut none of these photos you have uh, do it justice I have a whole bunch on my cell phone that uh, um, I think uh, Trevor has seen some uh, the bank at, is about four to five feet from where the mud or the bottom of the creek is there, uh, up so three in some areas, maybe as much as five in others, and it's vertical and it's undercut almost all along there. What we get the erosion, it's not a tidal erosion, I don't think. I think it's when we have any kind of a major rain event. The volume of water that comes down Powhatan Creek on a big rain event is pretty strong, um, and it moves fast. And I think that's where it's been cutting into there. Um, and we're worried, you know, the house is 24, the corner of the house is 24 feet from the, from the creek, and at the closest area there, the bank has slumped, the, you, again, can't see it very well from the pictures, but it's, it's slumped um, probably about eight feet back from the edge there. It's, there's a whole area that's starting to slump and just give way in there and subside, and it's going to cause... You know, if nothing is done there, it's going to cause a significant problem as it gets towards the house. Um, the other thing, we, we initially went into this wanting a living shoreline, thinking that that's, you know, that would be great. Wonderful wildlife habitat out here. Living shoreline would be great. You know, the, the, the two problems are the, the steepness of the bank and the height of it, and the other is these, the submerged aquatic vegetation. If you saw the, that... The one picture was a very low tide where the water was out about maybe four feet from the edge of the, uh, the bank there. Um, and right there is where the, the submerged aquatic vegetation starts. And it's, it's a dense mat of SAVs out there. And, you know, we obviously don't want to mess with that. And putting in, obviously, a living shoreline solution, you know, w wouldn't work because of that. You'd have to cover that with 10 feet of rock. Um, and a revetment... Again, we had Mr. You know, Carla and Mr. Jordan came out and, and looked at all this, and you know, their professional uh, recommendation was that a revetment was going to cause just as much problems as well. It was, you're going to have to excavate way back up into the upland and go out, affecting the SAVs, and it was just going to be uh, a lot more impact than just putting the, the, the short length of bulkhead here. I mean, we have, I've never measured it, but we probably have at least a quarter mile of frontage on our property, maybe more. Um, and, you know, we just want just this 75-foot piece that's eroding towards the house. And plus, with doing the bulkhead, we'll, we hopefully can save all those trees that are getting badly undercut right now. So that's all the, uh, that's kind of the thinking behind this. Um, and do you have any, any other questions? How, how high will the bulkhead be uh, relative to the current Bank level, basically. Um, I think that probably been for five foot bulkheads. So the bank, it's higher to the you know when you're looking out towards the creek here, it's a bit higher on the right side and a little bit lower on the left side towards the boat ramp and the dock. Um, when you get over to the right side here, I mean that bank is, you know, the, the leading edge of it is probably three feet high, but then there's a it kind of sits back and comes up again, and I think we're like say it's. Not much above the existing area there. We may put, I'm expecting they'll probably put a little higher and fill in some, <coughs> some topsoil, some good, you know, we want to put, there's no topsoil on most of this, but somewhere in the past, all the topsoil has disappeared from the, all this stretch of the riverbank here. So we want to stabilize this, put in some good soil, and then do plantings. You know, obviously, we're going to do the bunch grasses, and then we're probably going to do some additional bushes and you know, some good native plantings along there to make a nice buffer along the creek, and that's the, uh, that's the intent. So not, not a bulkhead that's going to stick up, you know, several feet and be, be uh, um, you know, we don't want to look like a wall. We just want to stop the erosion problem. Thank you. Thanks. Anyone else like to speak on this matter? If not, then we'll go ahead and we'll close the public hearing. Chairman, I'd like to speak to Ms. Havens again, if we can. 
Can you open the public hearing? Uh, yes, we'll reopen the public hearing. Carla, with, with, um, with the applicant uh, represented in terms of the scour and the cause of the scour, and that creek does get high, um, is there any concern for the downstream end of the bulkhead and scour that likely might occur, or do you think that um, riprap at the end is going <coughs> to abate that potential? All right, so where the bulkhead terminates, it, it's going to butt up to the existing boat ramp. So the ramp is a slope structure, so it kind of acts as a buffer, but that's where the turn is, and that's where the marsh picks up again. It gets really, really wide. Um, you know, this, this site is probably a fill site. It was probably all marsh years ago, and it probably got filled in, and... They, they I'm just, I'm trying to document the file for the purposes of making sure that we've gone through the sequence of if, if we can't do a bulk or a riprap, why can't we and why is a bulkhead more appropriate? And so I appreciate your explanation. I'm just concerned that, as you know, you get a lateral movement of force along the bulkhead and it lets go at the very end. And so I just don't want to incur additional erosion downstream of the structure that's all yeah I think the boat ramps gonna help with that and then we've got the the revetment underneath the pier that's again higher in the landscape and then the marsh just boom picks right up and it's it's in that turn I don't know if, um, if you're really familiar with that part of the creek there's a battle down it the, okay so where that dead tree is yeah. it's right in the middle of the creek um, we're not even going that far because the marsh the marsh just gets really really wide there again. Thank you very much. All right, would anyone else like to speak on this matter? If not, we'll close the hearing again and uh, open it for staff deliberations. Mr. Chairman, I, I just, this is a little unusual. We don't see too many bulkhead applications and you know, the wetlands guidelines kind of bulkheads are the last resort. I appreciate the explanation that's been presented by the applicant and, and his agent. Um, I just wanted to make sure that we documented that for the file. I have uh, <clears throat> a couple little issues with it there that I'd like to get straight in my own mind. The boat ramp, people that have property on the creek, matter of fact, I live on that creek myself, uh, like to be able to pull their boat out or put it in the water and they have their home there and they store their stuff there and it's they don't like to take it two miles away just to be able to put it in the water is that ramp uh, and maybe you don't have an answer to this is that ramp there going to be what it is or are you going in there and dredge out and pour a concrete platform and then shove the concrete into the mud to make it deeper so you can offload the boat what 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 is that what what what's how's that going to be constructed or do you know there is no Hold dredging. on just one moment i'm sorry just we need to reopen the the public hearing so please go ahead carla havens mid-atlantic resource consulting there is no dredging proposed for any portion of this project no dredging the boat ramp was started by the original property owner the original permittee they just never put the paver blocks on top. I don't know why. Mr. Goldsmith doesn't know why. So we want to just put the paver blocks on there, on the existing gravel bed that is out there. Yeah, I, I understand that. My question, I guess, is, is in the mud that, that the tide is covering the boat ramp, it, and I'm sure there's mud there, how is that going to be constructed uh, it was my question is you can't put pavers down in the mud when you're not you can't even get to it is that is that something that you're just going to leave you're going to bring the pavers to the water's edge and then leave the rest of it as it is just to put the boat in the stone extends into the creek beyond mean low water as was originally permitted if you go there on a really low tide you will see the stone bed extends out into the creek the paver blocks will go out as far as the stone extends no excavation, no no dredging. The stones are going on what's there and, and no more. And I can appreciate uh, a man or family wanting to have a ramp. And I, I would want it myself if I had 
my boats there. So I don't think that's a real issue there, as long as you're not disturbing the mud and everything and creating a problem. That, that was my main objective right there. And it sounds like to me you're not. You're just going to be putting your paver blocks on existing stone and uh, making it so you can back in on it, really, and put exactly. your Exactly. Okay. All right. Well, that answers that question there. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Any other questions for? Is there anyone else who'd like to speak on this subject? Please come forward. Mr. Chairman, I move uh, that we adopt the resolution to grant the permit. Hold on, request. Mr. Uh, Mr. Rodley. We, um, oh, we, I just no. want to make one thing clear. Um, she said that the boat ramp that is now there was put in by the previous by the original owners, that's not true. It was put in by the people that bought the house before them. My parents never put in a dock. Okay. So just to clarify that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, if there's anyone else who'd like to speak, then we'll close this public hearing. And are there any other staff considerations we wanted to, or staff discussions? I have a motion. Motion to adopt the resolution to grant the permit request for Wetlands Board case number WJPA 22 0015 at 258 Sandy Bay Road. We have a motion to adopt. Mr. Roadley? Yes. Mr. Waltrip? Yes. Mr. Lukens? Yes. Mr. Dunn? Yes. The motion passes. That concludes our uh, our public hearings for tonight. Um, there are no board considerations. We do have one matter of special privilege. Uh, we have a video of the completion of the Carter Grove project. Good afternoon, uh, board. Um, almost two years ago, uh, this board <coughs> permitted a uh, living shoreline approach, uh, a significant one on the Carter's Grove property. Um, during that meeting, um, we as staff uh, promised the board an update on how it was going and then a completion project. Um, we have since uh, gained drone footage of the completed project and wanted to share that with you. or the contractor has expressed that they do intend to come back and uh, fill those in more. If I may... The, um, this project entailed 1.1 miles of shoreline restoration, a revetment of significant length, and 11 new breakwater structures, uh, and over two acres of uh, uh, wetland plantings. Thank you. Mr. Long, 
And that concludes the Wetlands Board. Can I have a motion to adjourn? Meeting adjourned. All right. Call to order the James City County's Chesapeake Bay Board. The responsibility of this board is to carry out locally the Commonwealth policy to protect against and minimize pollution and deposition of sediments in wetlands, streams, and lakes in James City County, which are tributaries of the Chesapeake Bay. Can I have a roll call, Mr. Wilson? Mr. Roadley? Here. Mr. Waltrip? Here. Mr. O'Brien? Mr. Lukens? Here. Mr. Dunn? Here. All right, everyone had an opportunity to review the, the meeting minutes from June 8th. This was a meeting that we had to uh, go back and revise. Are there any changes? All right, uh, a motion to approve the minutes from the June 8th, 2022 meeting as presented. So moved. Minutes are accepted. And then we have to do the meetings, uh, the minutes for the July 13th, 2022 regular board meeting. Sure everyone's had a chance to see those. Any? And I have a motion to approve the minutes from the July 13th, 2022 meeting as presented. So moved. The minutes are accepted. The outline for tonight's public hearings will be a staff presentation followed by any questions or clarifications from the board. Then the public hearing will be opened. At that time, anybody wishing to speak may do so once called upon by the chair. All public speakers must state their name and address for the record. After everyone wishing to speak has done so, the public hearing will be closed and discussion amongst the board will start. The first public hearing tonight, CBPA Tech 22 Tech 01 Tech or 04 at 105 Ambrose Hill. Ms. Benedict? Uh, Mr. Uh, Dunn, Mr. Chair, uh, before we start, I just want to remind the board and the public that uh, there are only four board members present tonight. It does in this in, we need three affirmative votes to pass any measure. Um, and I just want to make sure everybody is aware of that. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair, members of the board. My name is Robin Benedict, Watershed Planner, uh, presenting CBPA 22-0104. Mr. Joseph Crawlinger and Mr. Michael Matthews from the Structures Group have applied for a Chesapeake Bay exception on behalf of Mr. Scott and Ms. Jeannie Trainum for encroachments into the RPA buffer for the replacement and construction of a retaining wall located at 105 Ambrose Hill within the Kings Mill subdivision and the College Creek watershed. You can see the parcel um, right underneath this arrow here outlined in blue. This parcel was platted in 1981 prior to the adoption of the Chesapeake Bay Preserva Preservation Ordinance in 1990. Here's an aerial photograph of the property. Topography, um, right behind where there is a portion of existing retaining wall, you can see a steep drop off. The resource protection area coming up a little more than halfway through this property. The total lot size of this property is 0 0.54 acres of which 57% is located within the RPA. Existing conditions of the property include a gradual slope to the rear of the property with a timber retaining wall at the top of the slope. You can see that here in, um, in this image. In orange is the existing retaining wall um, along the left side. There's a small break where there is only a fence line and then a small continuation of the retaining wall. The applicants are proposing to remove the existing timber wall and replace and expand with a block retaining wall. Total impacts to the RPA associated with this proposal equate to 45 square feet of impacts to the landward 50 foot RPA. Required mitigation for this amount of impervious impacts equals four shrubs. 
So here is the proposed site plan um, showing the 100 foot and 50 foot resource protection areas and the new retaining wall um, that now continues along that existing fence line. Here is site photography looking at the left side of the retaining wall as it currently exists, moving along the back of the wall, showing where the break in the wall begins, and then looking at the existing fence line. Um, a little difficult to see the slope, but this is how the uh, how the retaining wall currently looks from inside the fence line on the property. Staff has evaluated the application and exception request for the replacement and construction of a retaining wall. This application meets the ordinance conditions in sections 23-11 and 23-14 and should be heard by the board because the construction of a retaining wall is considered accessory in nature. The board may grant exceptions to section 23-7 if the application meets the following five conditions. The exception request is the minimum necessary to afford relief. Granting the exception will, will not confer upon the applicants any special privileges denied by chapter 23, Chesapeake Bay Preservation of the James City County Code to other property owners similarly situated in the vicinity. The exception request will be in harmony with the purpose and intent of chapter 23 of the James City County Code and is not a substantial detri detriment to water quality. The exception request is not based on conditions or circumstances that are self-created or self-imposed, nor does the request arise from conditions or circumstances either permitted or non-conforming that are related to adjacent parcels, and reasonable and appropriate conditions are imposed which will prevent the exception request from causing a degradation of water quality. Staff has reviewed the application and exception request and has determined the impacts associated with the proposal to be minor for the proposed development. Staff recommends approval for this exception request, and if the board wishes to approve the request, staff recommends the following conditions be incorporated into the approval. The applicant must obtain all of the necessary federal, state, and local permits as required for the project. The submittal of a mitigation plan equating to four shrubs be submitted to the Stormwater and Resource Protection Division prior to the project's start. A surety of $250 be submitted in a form acceptable to the James City County Attorney's Office to guarantee the mitigation plantings. In this exceptional request, approval shall become null and void if construction has not begun by September 14, 2023, with a written request for an extension submitted to the Stormwater and Resource Protection Division no later than August 3, 2023, which is six weeks prior to the expiration date. Thank you. If there are any questions, I'd be happy to answer them at this time. This new uh, uh, wall, you're going to take the same fence that's above it, the uh, looks like the anchor or metal fence, and put it on the new wall, or or is that you're taking away that uh, four foot uh, fence? That says, there, there will still be a fence on the property. I guess my question was if they put a new wall they're going to take that same fence and put it back on that new wall yes okay well the will they be removing the well let me two questions one what is the problem with the existing wall i will defer that to the applicant yes secondly then are they putting it along the exact same alignment or are they encroaching a little further into the into the it, buffer there is a small variance in the footprint, um, just a slight extension out into the RPA. Questions for staff? Thank you, Ms. Benedict. I'll open the public hearing. Anyone like, like to speak on this matter? Please come forward. State your name and address for the record, please. Joe Kralinger, I'm with the Structures Group. Uh, 3904 Matthew Circle. Does the board have any questions? What's, the, what's wrong with the existing wall? The existing timber wall is starting to rot and deteriorate. And so we're just going to replace it with a segmental block retaining wall. As close to the alignment as possible. We're following, let's see if I can, we're following the same footprint. So. 
here's our existing wall. So it extends from here, and then the part in the RPA is from over here into here, it terminates for a brief period, and then it picks up again. What we're proposing is to follow the same footprint. We're just going to create a continuous wall across the section. Is this a block wall or just the same? Yes, sir. It's a segmental block concrete wall. Block concrete. Yep. No further questions for me? Thank you. Anyone else like to speak on this matter? If not, we'll go ahead and close the public hearing and open it up to the board. Chairman, I um, agree with staff's uh, position. I consider this rather minor encroachment. Um, and given that the structure is failing, the existing structure is certainly something perhaps needs to be done. So I have no issues with the proposal. I concur. I have no objections to it. Would anyone like to make a motion? I move to adopt a resolution to grant the exception request for the Chesapeake Bay Board case number C A dash twenty two dash zero one zero four at one oh five Ambrose Hill. The motion is to adopt. Mr. Roadley? Yes. Mr. Waltrip? Yes. Mr. Lukens? Yes. Mr. Dunn? Yes. The motion passes. Next case, uh, CBPA-22-0109, 124 Thomas Cartwright. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, Robin Benedict, Watership Planner, presenting CBPA 22-0109. Mr. Sean Alburn has applied for a Chesapeake Bay exception for encroachments into the RPA buffer for the construction of a fishing platform located at 124 Thomas Cartwright within the Kingsmo subdivision and the Skiffs Creek watershed. Here you can see the parcel highlighted in blue. The parcel was platted in 1988 prior to the adoption of the Chesapeake Bay Preservation Ordinance in 1990. Here's aerial photography of the site, the project uh, location down by the water. Topography, a uh, steep slope from um, back of the house down towards the water. The floodplain as it affects this property and the resource protection area shown in green as it affects this property coming up <clears throat> just behind the back of the house. The total lot size of this property is 1.05 acres of which 58% is located within the RPA. The applicants are proposing to construct a six foot by eight foot wooden fishing platform on land. Additionally, the applicants have proposed the construction of stairs as access to the fishing platform. Total impacts to the RPA associated with this proposal equate to 72 square feet of impacts to the landward 50-foot RPA and 178 square feet of impacts to the seaward 50-foot RPA. Therefore, total impacts to the RPA equate to 250 square feet of, of impacts. Required mitigation for this amount of impervious impacts <coughs> equals one canopy tree and 13 shrubs. Additional shrubbery requirements were added to um, this exception request because the applicant may have to remove multiple smaller trees for this project. Looking at the site plan, um, the 100 foot resource protection area and the 50 foot resource protection area are shown in red. The proposed fishing platform down here by the water and the proposed stairs um, leading up the slope. Here is site photography looking around the edge of water and moving towards the right on the property. And here are some of the trees that may need to be removed for this project, um, causing that additional shrub requirement. And looking back up the slope um, towards wh where the proposed stairs will be, leading up to the house. Staff has evaluated the application and exception request for the construction of a fishing platform. 
This application meets the ordinance conditions in sections 23-11 and 23-14 and should be heard by the board because the construction of a fishing platform is considered accessory in nature. The board may grant exceptions to section 23-7 if the application meets the following five conditions. The exception request is the minimum necessary to afford relief. Granting the exception will not confer upon the applicant any special privileges denied by Chapter 23, Chesapeake Bay Preservation of the James City County Code to other property owners similarly situated in the vicinity. The exception request will be in harmony with the purpose and intent of Chapter 23 of the James City County Code and is not of a substantial detriment to water quality. The exception request is not based on conditions or circumstances that are self-created or self-imposed, nor does the request arise from conditions or circumstances either permitted or non-conforming that are related to adjacent parcels, and reasonable and appropriate conditions are imposed which will prevent the exception request from causing a degradation of water quality. Staff has reviewed the application and exception request and has determined the impacts associated with the proposal to be minor for the proposed development. Staff recommends approval for this exception request, and if the board wishes to approve the request, staff recommends the following conditions be incorporated into the approval. The applicant must obtain all other necessary federal, state, and local permits as required for the project, including a building permit if necessary. All development activities located in the special flood hazard area shall comply with Article 6, Division 3, floodplain area regulations of the James City County Zoning Ordinance and receive all required approvals and permits prior to commencement of such activities. The submittal of a mitigation plan equating to one canopy tree and 13 shrubs be submitted to the Stormwater and Resource Protection Division prior to project start. A surety of $500 be submitted in a form acceptable to the James City County Attorney's Office to guarantee the mitigation plantings. And this exception request approval shall become null and void if construction has not begun by September 14, 2023, with a written request for an extension to the exception submitted to the Stormwater and Resource Protection Division no later than August 3, 2023, which is six weeks prior to the expiration date. Thank you. If there are any questions, I'd be happy to answer them at this time. Is this uh, platform going to be in the water or strictly on land? On land. On land. Yes, sir. The end of it will be at the water's edge, probably. Yes, sir. Describe the construction. I cannot confidently describe that, but um, I believe the applicant is here today. Is there a contractor that's doing the work? I will defer that to the applicant to answer. Robin, I noticed in some of the photos that there had been some trees cut or some limbing. Has that been coordinated through the county? Um, not to my knowledge. Um, I'm not sure, Mr. Wilson or Mr. Long, if they have any recollection of that. Other uh, questions for staff? Ms. Benedict? We'll open the public hearing. Would the applicant like to come forward? Please state your name and address for the record, sir. Sean Auburn, 124, Thomas Cartwright. So the question on the trees cut, those we moved into the house in April. And I think anything you saw that was sort of top down there, that was the previous owner. Um, the uh, platform itself, the construction, really the, the, the main purpose is just a super steep slope and we'd like to be able to access down there and do a little fishing. Um, and you almost, it's hard to kind of stand down there. So uh, it's gonna be essentially four, probably eight by eights uh, posts and then a basic wooden platform on top of that. I haven't gone to a contractor yet. I kind of want to go through the approval process first. So you'll be raised off the slope a bit. I mean, we some will. idea of two, three, four feet or at yes. the low end or something. Yeah, like there's, that. I, I've given some thought to cantilevering the front posts a little bit so I can kind of get it down some. Um, but if I'm fortunate enough to catch a big one, I'm probably going to have to get off the platform and get muddy. <laughs> OK. 
because it won't be, you know, a foot from the water. I'm probably going to be three to four feet above the water, at least. Why not just build a, uh, mm. just put a pier out in the water rather than building a platform so for land? So I don't think the neighborhood would approve that. Um, it, it, it's uh, on Warren's Pond, which is in the Kingsville neighborhood, and I'm, I've taken a good look around. There's a, there's a handful of similar platforms that are at the water's edge. There's one that's kind of in the water, but there's really no such thing as a pier on that pond. I just I think it would be a precedent the neighborhood probably won't go for. I would love a pier, but I don't think it would happen. And this is Kings Mill? Yes. All right. Kings Mill have to approve anything that happens on where I'm spawn. Uh, I think they have to approve almost any kind of construction. Is this gone before them? No, I figured this was the first step. Mr. Waltrip, if I may, Wareham's Pond is owned by Kings Mill proper. Uh, it is not under individual uh, ownership. So not only would they need to get um, approval from case, um, KCSA, but they would also need to get approval from uh, the Corps of Engineers um, and potentially VMRC for going into the pond itself. Um, so I believe, and I don't want to speak for the applicant, but I believe that was the reasons for putting it up on the shore. That's pretty fair. Really just to make uh, the pond accessible for us to, to fish is all I'm, and if there's other ways that you'd prefer me to do it, I'm certainly open to suggestions. I try to look at what would be minimal. Is there a walkway that's being built down to it? Or That's it the right? stairs that we talked about. So, um, a well, stair step goes down. Correct. Gotcha. Yep. Uh, you mentioned there are other structures around the pond, and I don't recall. I haven't been to that pond in a long time, but um, you know, part of the goal of the board is to, for the successive projects that come forward, is to help minimize the cumulative impact to the greatest extent possible. So. In your thoughts on design as you move this forward, should it be approved, I would just keep that in mind that we're looking for this, the smallest footprint that satisfies your need sure. and, and so forth. And the, the size that I asked for approval for was six by eight. Uh, the more I look at it, I think it's going to end up smaller. It wouldn't end up any bigger. I have a feeling it won't be six feet deep. It might be closer to four, and it might be more like six feet wide instead of eight. So that's the max, but I think it's going to end up smaller if we can get it done. Thank you. Any other questions for the applicant? Thank you, sir. Is there anyone else who'd like to speak on this matter? Okay, we'll close the public hearing. Open the board discussions. Mr. Chairman, I don't have much of an issue with this, providing access to the pond. Um, it seems like a fairly minimal encroachment. Okay, can I have a motion? A motion to adopt the resolution to grant the exception request for Chesapeake Bay Board case CBPA 22-0109 at 124 Thomas Cartwright. We have a motion to adopt. Mr. Rodley? Yes. Mr. Waltrip? Yes. Mr. Lukens? Yes. Mr. Dunn? Yes. The motion passes. Okay, the next case, CBPA, TAC 22, TAC 00939250, Mount Zion Road. Mr. Long? Good afternoon, Mr. Chair, members of the board, Trevor Long, James City County Watershed Planner, here present CBPA-22-0093, 
4925 Six Mount Zion Road, otherwise known as Stonehouse Tract S, Phase 1. <clears throat> Mr. Jeff Huntelman of Land Planning Solutions, Inc. has applied for a Chesapeake Bay exception on behalf of MCP Stonehouse, LLC, for encroachments into the RPA buffer for the installation of a sanitary sewer line located at 9250 Six Mount Zion Road and 9150 Six Mount Zion Road within the Stonehouse subdivision and the Ware Creek watershed. You can see this parcel above here in blue with the watershed demarcator here in yellow. Again, this project is also known as uh, Stonehouse Tract S Phase 11. Total scope of development for this project uh, is between the two properties, or between the two properties, 42.26 acres, of which 21% is located within the RPA. Uh, above here, you can see these two properties um, with the topography of the area that you all are going to be uh, mostly looking into above, and the resource protection area uh, that I was just describing here in green. The applicant is proposing to install a sanitary sewer associated with the development of the Tract S Stonehouse subdivision equating to approximately 20,908 square feet of impacts to the landward 50-foot RPA and 5,227 square feet of impacts to the seaward 50-foot RPA. Total impacts to the RPA associated with this proposal equate to 26,136 square feet of impacts. Uh, Above on your screens, you can see the overall site plan, a couple different colors and things going on here. Uh, this is the overall site plan. In red, we have the resource protection area. Uh, and green, the wetlands that are um, found on site. The area in purple is um, the impacts of which are here before the board tonight. So mostly here in this southern region that we are looking at, and a uh, site plan showing a bit more uh, in-depth uh, view of those areas. Uh, again, this red here is the 100-foot resource protection area, the green being the edge of the wetlands, and the purple being the sanitary sewer impacts. We do have a couple of other impacts associated with bank grading being proposed in these two locations as well that is before this board tonight. Because the sanitary sewer will have a 20-foot permanent maintenance easement, there will be a permanent loss of RPA buffer and associated water quality benefits in this area as well. Required mitigation for this amount of impervious impacts equals 65 planting units. The applicant has provided a plan showing approximately 53,143 square feet of natural open space on site as mitigation. This fulfills county mitigation requirements, and a plan showing this is also on your screen above, the area of which they have dedicated to deed as natural open space um, is shown in green here. This natural open space is area uh, that, much like the RPA, has restrictions about what you may or may not do within it, um, is intended to remain entirely natural. Staff has evaluated the application and exception request for the installation of a sanitary sewer line. This application meets the ordinance conditions in sections 23-11 <coughs> and 23-14 and should be heard by the board because the installation of a sanitary sewer is not water dependent and is proposed to be constructed within the seaward 50-foot RPA. Board may grant exceptions to section 23-7 if the application meets the following five conditions. The exception request is the minimum necessary to afford relief. Granting the exception will not confer upon the applicant any special privileges denied by Chapter 23, Chesapeake Bay Preservation of the James City County Code to other property owners similarly situated in the vicinity. The exception request will be in harmony with the purpose and intent of Chapter 23 of the James City County Code and is not of substantial detriment to water quality. The exception request is not based on conditions or circumstances that are self-created or self-imposed, nor does the request arise from conditions or circumstances either permitted or non-conforming that are related to adjacent parcels, and that reasonable and appropriate conditions are imposed which will prevent the exception request from causing a degradation of water quality. A couple of site photographs um, 
here is the one of the sanitary sewer crossings. It's a little hard to make out. However, you can see blue flagging uh, down near the crossing. Looking back up uh, towards um, another crossing. Again, these blue flags indicating uh, sanitary sewer. Another area of crossing and, and uh, RPA impacts. Staff has reviewed the application exception request and has determined the impacts associated with this proposal to be major for the proposed development. Staff recommends approval of this exception request and if the board wishes to approve the request, staff recommends the following conditions be incorporated into the approval. The applicant must obtain all other necessary federal, state, and local permits as required for the project. The deed of natural open space be recorded in the James City County Courthouse prior to the issuance of a land disturbance disturbing permit, that this exception request approval shall become null and void if construction has not begun by September 14th, 2023, with written requests for an extension uh, to this exception be submitted to the Stormwater and Resource Protection Division no later than August 3rd, 2023, just six weeks prior to the expiration date of this permit. Thank you very much. I'd be happy to answer any questions the board may have at this time. These crossings, uh on piles or, uh, as you cross these areas on ductile iron or they? I believe they would be on piles, so I will let the applicant um, confirm that. In, in line with that, uh, there was some recent, within the last 18 months, um, below grade sewer constructed along Fieldstone. Um, it was a little sloppy. Uh, then I will certainly let the, uh, the applicant address uh, their, their plans for that. This, this may be a question for the applicant, but I'm wondering what, what it means to remove areas from the VRRM. Uh, does that have an impact on runoff reduction overall? Does that have other impacts with other permitting that require specific numbers for runoff reduction and so forth? Well, I know we have um, certainly reviewed the VRM calculations uh, for the entirety of this project. Um, I'll let the applicant also um, touch on that um, as they're more familiar with that, that portion of this project. So you said there was, it, this for the sanitary sewer line installation, but then you also said there was grading that was also being done. Yes, uh, there is grading that's also here before the board. Um, there's a couple different impacts. Um, again, the the ones uh, here are for the sanitary sewer. These I misspoke earlier. There are actually three, I believe, um, grading impacts uh, that also need to be heard by this board um, as they um, are not water dependent and cannot be approved administratively. You know. Uh do you know why they have to be done? Uh, it's been expressed to me, um, though I will allow the contractor to further explain uh, their reasoning, um, that it is for either safety um, of the, uh, the lots or uh, access. Okay. <clears throat> Any other questions for staff? All right, thank you, Mr. Long. Thank you. It will open the public hearing. Would the applicant like to come forward and or their representative? Please state your name and address for the record. Good evening, Chairman, members of the board. My name is Jeff Huntelman with Land Planning Solutions. Address is 1403 Greenbrier Parkway, Chesapeake, Virginia. Um, yes, I'm curious about the uh, ex you know extracting areas from your runoff reduction uh, process or procedure it was uh, noted it was noted in um, the comments we got anything that we take and put in preservation for the to, to offset for the impacts we can't also claim in our VRMM spreadsheet as being woods so we just had to take that out of claiming it as woods for water quality and putting it to turf um, so it was just like we're not getting credit for it for VRMM and getting credit for it for replacing impacts yeah, so it's, it's not 
um, any any amendment to that area will not affect your categorization for runoff reduction or right. if you're doing additional planting and so forth that's correct mm -hmm. are we correct that it is an aerial sewer crossing it is it is a, on a bridge so the one right there this is sanitary sewer impacts that is actually the sanitary sewer bridge um got the arrow here this one right here this one over here is actually a a, a water line crossing um it's not a sanitary crossing. It was a water crossing, and that is going to be um, buried in the ground. And so it's not going to be an aerial crossing there. Um, and that is to provide redundancy for the um, Stonehouse area. And I assume you're just chasing grade on the other two? Buffers. Yeah, there's some steep slope issues. Um, and, you know, we talked to SRP about using retaining walls or grading or doing steeper, you know, steeper grading. And I think it was, you know, recommended to us to try to avoid the retaining walls because of issues they've had and avoid doing two-to-one slopes um, due to erosion issues. And so we are proposing to do three-to-one maximum slopes with um, EC3 matting to make sure it's stabilized and just tying down to uh, the grade as quickly as we can. So it was, try to, it was more of a thought of long-term maintenance of this area it would be best to do it with uh, three to one slopes. Have you done your erosion control planning for this yet? Yes, we have. Um, what are your, your erosion control barriers? The reason I ask is the, the work I referenced, which is not here but down the road on, on uh, another section of Stonehouse, they had an in-ground sewer and they had terrible problems with sediment escaping that construction site. So I would encourage you to make sure that those are substantial enough to withstand you know, the, the heavy deluges that sometimes come down and wash that sediment out. Yeah, I'm not familiar with what happened down the street, but um, yeah. we've worked with SRP through a couple review cycles with our ENS plan, and, and I've taken a lot of their input and advice on a lot of the erosion issues they've had throughout this whole area. And so we've kind of changed our ENS plan to, as much as we can to foresee and accommodate a lot of those issues. It's all gravity across that aerial what, eight-inch eight inch, eight inch ductile? Ductile iron, yes, sir. Eight-inch. Eight-inch, yes. Why not pull the buffer grading back in outside the RPA and just shrink the lot size, those, those couple, uh, those half-dozen lots? Um, for the overall development, we've really tried our best to minimize lot size to the footprint that's needed. And if you if you had an overall of the whole track of track S, um, we really try to consolidate the development in the smallest amount of areas possible to preserve as much as we can. Um, I don't know if there was a total on the amount of area. This is phase one of track S. Um, there's just going to be a little bit more on phase two. But the overall track S um, parcel, we're preserving um, obviously the buffer area, but there's also significant other portions that we're not developing just to try to help minimize and consolidate the development. And so in this particular area, in order to fit everything in, you know, it fit the best way in this area to try to get the most units and preserve as much as we could. Um, but the lot sizes were already kind of set at like the minimum area that we needed. And so we felt like putting the lots here and saving more area in the back area um, closer to further downstream, the more pristine areas um, was a more logical way to go. So we tried to minimize as much as we could, reduce the lots as much as we could, and this area just happened to be a little drop off that kind of crept down because of some steep slopes that we want to try to fix and then just chase it down the hill a little bit is what caused it. Are those slopes currently eroding? Uh, not that I'm aware of. Um, I, I mean, I understand that the, the need for access, uh, I assume you looked at putting the access road perhaps between the lots and then letting the, the slope just be a part of the lot, or are you mass grading this site? Um, we are mass grading. Um, what was about the road? I missed that. So, I mean, in looking at ways to further avoid, part of the reason for the fill is the road, the access road. Uh, is that correct? Where th this road here? No, go down further to get to the BMP. Oh, this one here? 
Yes. Um, um, that was an access road to get to the BMP. Um, repeat your question. I'm sorry. So the question was, had you considered perhaps just putting the access between the lots and then? We, we did. Um, so we do have the storm outfall is right here within a 20-foot easement. Um, oh. And so it, it could go there. Um, don't recall exactly. I think it was um, just a placement of that. There is some steep slopes. This is a basement lot right here. And so the grading of that really drops off. There is some like a, there is an existing head cut right here that we're repairing at the back of these lots. And it really dropped off in this area. So it was tough. We couldn't, the easements over both lots, but we did one side of the lot kind of drops off in order to get down a grade in the basement. And so we didn't have enough room in there to make it work. Um, so we thought this was the best approach and it was also off to the side of a lot as opposed to in between people's lots. So we thought maintenance of, future maintenance of that would be better next to it. That'd be county responsibility at some point in the future maintenance or is that held by the HOA? The HOA, yes. Further questions, questions, Mr. Chairman? Thank you, sir. Thank you. Anyone else like to come forward and speak on this matter? If not, we'll go ahead and close the public hearing and open board, board discussions. Mr. Chairman, I have no issue with the aerial sewer crossing. I mean, that happened all over the county, and those tend to be fairly benign other than it's got shorter vegetation in it when it's done. Um, <clears throat> I can appreciate the need to uh, do some grading within the RPA to help achieve the overall site plan um, goal. Um, I, it's, it's hard to sit here and try to re-engineer on the bench what they have spent perhaps months planning um, it looks to me as though that's rather the, a minimal amount of encroachment given the scale and scope of the project. My thoughts. That, that there's that there's no, you know, there's there's no problems there right now, but they they have to go into the RPA to do the work. Um, my bigger issue was the ongoing, or not ongoing, but the erosion and sediment control issues that pop up during construction, uh, and just making sure that they're paying attention to the highly erodible soils that exist out there that have defeated most ENS measures in the past. Looks like it'd probably be a right much erosion because that's a pretty good size development right there and most all of it's going to be cleared I'm sure I don't know whether it's whether this tree is going to be left on lots or do they clear not the whole mass thing grading. pardon not if they're mass grading what I was thinking so it's really going to be some erosion they're going to have to play pay uh, close attention to the erosion problem there but uh, other than that it's gravity sore Cross. We've done a pretty good job on it. I, I think it, it's all well this can be done. Anyone would like to make a motion? I'll make a motion to adopt resolution to grant the exception request for Chesapeake Bay Board case CBPA 22-0093 at 92506 Mountain Zion Road. So we have a motion to adopt Mr. Roadley? Yes. Mr. Waltrip? Yes. Mr. Lukens? Yes. Mr. Dunn? Yes. Motion passes.
Okay, so the next uh, next hearing, CBPA, TAC 22, TAC 0107, 9100, 6 Mount Zion Road. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, Robin Benedict, Watershed Planner, presenting CBPA 22-0107. Mr. Jeff Huntelman with Land Planning Solutions has applied for a Chesapeake Bay exception on behalf of MCP Stonehouse, for encroachments into the RPA buffer for the installation of a sanitary sewer line located at 9100 Six Mount Zion Road within the Stonehouse subdivision in the Ware Creek watershed. This project is also known as Stonehouse Track 11A Phase 1. Here you can see the subject parcel uh, outlined in blue. And again, that's the Ware Creek watershed outlined here in yellow. Here's aerial photography. There um, is an existing stockpile, which is what you're seeing in this photo, but the project location is further to the right um, on this property. Zooming into that project location, here is the existing topography and the resource protection area. The total lot size of this property is 44.39 acres, of which 22% is located within the RPA. The applicant is proposing to install a sanitary sewer line equating to approximately 8,276 square feet of impacts to the landward 50-foot RPA and 3,920 square feet of impacts to the seaward 50-foot RPA. Total impacts to the RPA associated with this proposal equate to 12,189 square feet of impacts. Because the sanitary sewer will have a 20-foot permanent maintenance easement, there will be a permanent loss of RPA buffer and associated water quality benefits. Required mitigation for this amount of impervious impacts equals 30 planting units. The applicant has proposed 32,234 square feet of undisturbed natural open space as mitigation. On your screen is the overall site plan for um, Stonehouse Track 11A but we'll be zooming into this area where you can see the 100 foot resource protection area outlined in red, the edge of wetlands shown in green, and then impacts for the sanitary sewer shown in purple. Um, here at this fork of the RPA over on the uh, top right matches with this area of the fork in the RPA over here on the left. So imagine this box just tacked on top of this area. Uh, there is also a small about 1500 square foot impact for associated grading um, shown by this area of purple in the RPA over there. And then we have the proposed mitigation, the area of undisturbed natural open space. Two of those areas are shown here adjacent to the RPA and then two additional areas shown here, again, adjacent to the RPA. Here is site photography, looking at the fork um, in the resource protection area and following down that, um, that ravine on the opposite side and looking at the um, areas of grading. Staff has evaluated the application and exception request for the installation of a sanitary sewer line. This application meets the ordinance conditions in sections 23-11 and 23-14 and should be heard by the board because the installation of a sanitary sewer is not water dependent and is not proposed or and is proposed to be constructed within the RPA buffer. The board may grant exceptions to section 23-7 if the application meets the following five conditions. The exception request is the minimum necessary to afford relief. Granting the exception will not confer upon the applicants any special privileges denied by Chapter 23, Chesapeake Bay Preservation of the James City County Code to other property owners similarly situated in the vicinity. The exception request will be in harmony with the purpose and intent of Chapter 23 of the James City County Code and is not of substantial detriment to water quality. The exception request is not based on conditions or circumstances that are self-created or self-imposed, 
nor does the request arise from conditions or circumstances either permitted or non-conforming that are related to adjacent parcels and reasonable and appropriate conditions are imposed which will prevent the exception request from causing a degradation of water quality. Staff has reviewed the application and exception request and has determined the impacts associated with the proposal to be major for the proposed development. Staff recommends approval for this exception request, and if the board wishes to approve this request, staff recommends the following conditions be incorporated into the approval. The applicant must obtain all other necessary federal, state, and local permits as required for the project. Deed of natural open space be recorded in the Williamsburg James City County Courthouse prior to the issuance of a land disturbing permit. And this exception request approval shall become null and void if construction is not begun by September 14th, 2023, with a written request for an extension to the exception submitted to the Stormwater and Resource Protection Division no later than August 3rd, 2023, which is six weeks prior to the expiration date. Thank you. If there are any questions, I'd be happy to answer them at this time. Thank you. Okay, we will open the public hearing with the applicant or the representative like to come forward and speak. Please state your name and address for the record, sir. Again, Jeff Huntelman, Land Planning Solutions, 1403 Greenbrier Parkway, Chesapeake, Virginia. Um, this one is adjacent to the previous one, and I just wanted to point out that um, it is a sewer bridge that is going to serve, that's going to connect into the pump station um, that's on track S. So the pump station for track S is going to be built right here. And this is the sewer bridge that's going to connect and provide sewer service for track 11A. This little bit of over here was really just the easement. We showed since the easement went into the buffer, we just showed it as an impact. Um, the sewer line is just outside of that, but we figured we include it in case they need to clear the trees for the easement in the future. Questions? All right, thank you, sir. Thank you. Would anybody else like to come forward and speak on this matter? Okay, we'll close the public hearing and open it to the board for discussions. This one's pretty straightforward, similar comments to the last application. Kerr. Okay. Chairman, I make a motion to adopt the resolution to grant the exception request for Chesapeake Bay Board case CBPA 22-0107 at 9100 6 Mount Zion Road. We have, a, <clears throat> we have a motion to adopt. Mr. Roadley? Yes. Mr. Waltrip? Yes. Mr. Lukens? Yes. Mr. Dunn? Yes. Motion passes. All right. Our last hearing for the night, CBPA TAC 22 TAC 0105124 James Gray Drive. Presentation by Mr. Long. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair, members of the board. Trevor Long here to present CBPA 22 0105. Mr. Chase Grog of Landtech Resources Inc. has applied for a Chesapeake Bay exception on behalf of Ms. Beverly Olson of Olson Fine Home Building for encroachments into the RPA buffer for the construction of a single family dwelling, deck, and retaining wall located at 124 James Bray Drive within the Forest Colony subdivision and the Powhatan Creek watershed. This parcel can be viewed above. It, while it is tiny, it is outlined here in blue. Again, the watershed divide is in yellow, and again, that is Powhatan Creek watershed. The parcel was platted in 1974. Uh, prior to the adoption of the Chesapeake Bay Preservation Ordinance in 1990. This parcel can be viewed above. Um, again, it is light. However, these red lines here indicate the, um, the lot in question. Total lot size of this property is 0.61 acres, of which 100% is located within the RPA. Um, a lot of that has to do with the uh, topographical restraints and the wetlands that are occur on lot. Um, for the board's uh, education, there is a sanitary sewer that does run through here. Um, however, you can see based on the resource protection area map listed above um, that the entirety of this lot is located within the RPA. Um, 
this part of the lot. RPA is colored here in yellow. I know it is hard to see, however, it extends approximately to here where I am um, waving the cursor. The applicant is proposing to construct a single family uh, home with an attached garage and deck. Due to the grade of the lot, the applicant is also proposing to construct a retaining wall on the northern side of the property. Total impacts to the RPA associated with this proposal equate to 332 square feet of impacts to the landward 50 foot RPA and 4,019 square feet of impacts to the seaward 50 foot RPA for a total of 4,351 square feet of impacts. This can be viewed here on the site plan above. Uh, here in red, we have the 100 foot resource protection area. Again, 100% of this lot is located within the RPA. Uh, and the 50 foot resource protection area being the second uh, red dashed line on this site plan. The portion of the house that is proposed within the landward 50 foot RPA can be found here in orange. And the portion of the house and driveway uh, located within the seaward 50 foot RPA here in yellow. This includes the deck and the retaining wall. The limits of clearing are shown here um, in the black line <coughs> with the edge of the wetlands here in green. Um, so there are two areas of wetland impacts associated with uh, grading for construction here and uh, construction grading and also portions of the house and deck being wetland impact area too. Um, these areas of wetland impacts equate to approximately 852 square feet um, and again they are proposed for the construction of the dwelling, deck and grading um, which will require a permit from the Army Corps of Engineers. Required mitigation for this amount of impervious impacts equals 11 planting units, which equates to 11 canopy trees, 22 understory trees, and 33 shrubs. The applicant has proposed the plantings of 11 planting units, therefore meeting county mitigation requirements. Uh, due to the proximity of this lot to the wetlands, there are no infiltration best management practices associated with this proposal. Um, on the uh, screen above, um, we do have a mitigation plan indicating the locations of the proposed plantings and um, we made sure they would all be with, uh, within the seaward 50 foot RPA for the most part. Uh, some site photographs, um, the orange in stakes here indicate the left portion of this driveway. There is a drainage swale that goes on the northern side of this property. As you can see, it is right here. Uh, the construction in this proposal is uh, to the right of this, this swale. Again, some more um, uh, flagging indicating the corners of houses. Standing approximately in a, uh, in a ravine with uh, wetlands adjacent to it, uh, here is uh, one of the wetland impact areas. And looking back up towards the street, uh, again, this is the area uh, from the back of the, the house looking forward into where the driveway and house would be. The board may grant exceptions uh, excuse me, staff has evaluated the application and exception request for the construction of a single family dwelling, deck, and retaining wall. The application meets the ordinance conditions in sections 23-11 and 23-14 and should be heard by the board because the construction of the single family dwelling extends into the seaward 50 foot RPA and the retaining wall is a considered accessory in nature. Board may grant exceptions to section 23-7 if the application meets the following five conditions. The exception request is the minimum necessary to afford relief. 
granting the exception will not confer upon the applicant any special privileges denied by Chapter 23, Chesapeake Bay Preservation of the James City County Code to other property owners similarly situated in the vicinity. The exception request will be in harmony with the purpose and intent of Chapter 23 of the James City County Code and is not of substantial detriment to water quality. The exception request is not based on conditions or circumstances that are self-created or self-imposed, nor does the request arise from conditions or circumstances either permitted or non-conforming that are related to adjacent parcels and that reasonable and appropriate conditions are imposed which will prevent the exception request from causing a degradation of water quality. Staff has reviewed the application and exception request and has determined the impacts associated with this proposal to be major for the proposed development. Uh, staff recommends approval for this exception request and if the board wishes to approve the request, staff recommends the following conditions be incorporated into its approval. The applicant must obtain all other necessary federal, state, and local permits as required for the pro uh, project. A surety of $5,500 be submitted in a form acceptable to the James City County Attorney's Office to guarantee the mitigation plantings. That an affidavit be recorded in the Williamsburg James City County Courthouse prior to the issuance of the building permit. That this exception request approval shall become null and void if construction has not begun by September 14th, 2023. And that written requests for an extension to an exception shall be submitted to the Stormwater and Resource Predict uh, Protection Division no later than August 3rd, 2023, which is six weeks prior to the expiration date of this permit. Thank you, and I would be happy to answer any questions the board may have at this time. Um, <clears throat> given the relative maturity of the woods and the lot and the vegetation there at this point, um, does, does staff feel that planting canopy, canopy, any canopy trees planted there would prosper. Uh, location that you're showing here for mitigation is is that area to be <coughs> cleared completely? Or? Yes. Um, so, on th that's uh, precisely why I was bouncing between the two. Um, this black squiggle here is the limits of clearing. Um, so everything within uh, within that envelope um, would likely be entirely cleared. Um, there may be some trees, I'm not aware of any, that may be kept. However, it's possible. Um, given that, it, I think it is possible that these canopy trees here may survive. Um, it's not so condensed in that area that I feel there would be a 100% chance that they would not survive. There, I, I don't. I guess there's no real uh, qualitative way, a quantitative way to uh, evaluate the difference between simply imposing removal of uh, pervious ground, uh, where you, in addition, have removal of existing canopy trees. Um, sort of putting back the canopy trees, but you're still getting a lot more uh, impervious area there. Not sure the, the I don't know how the how the numbers balance out there, or whether there's a way to do that quantitatively. Yes, sir. That does get difficult, and I understand that. When was this uh, platted? 1974. Trevor, could you go back to a larger view that shows the drainage that this, these wetlands are attached to, or if you have that available? Sir. I think this is the, the closest I can get to showing the downstream wetlands. Um, the purple area here is also RPA, um, indicating that there would be a wetland system coming through these contours and like, likely going to the west of this property.
Are these delineated for the purposes of this application? Yes, sir. Would it be helpful to go to the vicinity map as well? I think I know the area. I, I think you're correct. It does drain to the, in this image, the west. Um, my initial reasoning was just to make sure that they were connected and contiguous. Um, but with that larger wetland complex, see the connection. You said there's going to be portions of the wetlands that will be lost that will be filled in for this uh, construction? Yes, sir. And those are outlined here in green. Um, so part, there, there's two areas of wetland impacts. Um, one part just associated with grading for the construction of the house. And um, that's uh, this, this area here. And the second one is a draw that would come up through the middle of this lot and is proposed, um, and the, the deck and part of the house are proposed to impact that area. You indicated that they're not proposing um, any infiltration because of the soil quality. Uh, is there any, are they, how are they dealing at all with runoff, if any way? That I, I do not know, um, but I will allow the, uh, the contractor to speak on that issue. Um, on that note, the contractor did provide a soils report, um, and it is in the Novus board package, if um, that would be helpful uh, to view. Any more questions for staff? All right. Thank you, Mr. Long. Thank you. And I'll open the public hearing. The applicant or the representative come forward. And please state your name and address for the record, sir. Good evening, members of the board. Chase Grog with Land Tech Resources, 205 Bullifonts Boulevard, Suite E, Williamsburg, Virginia. Uh, hope you guys are having a good evening. Just want to go through a couple bullet points uh, and answer some of your guys' questions, and then happy to answer any other follow-ups you guys have. Uh, for the wetlands themselves, uh, yes, they were delineated for this site. We've uh, gotten the Army Corps confirmation back, as well as the permit uh, from the Army Corps to complete those impacts. Uh, they are separate mitigation that will be completed for those impacts alone on top of the mitigation we're doing for the RPA um, side of things. Uh, to address the drainage, uh, on the left side, on top of that utility easement, Ford's Colony carries a seven and a half drainage easement along all property lines. Uh, so if you look on that site plan right at the end here, the, the cul-de-sac actually drains out into a concrete swale here into some riprap and actually from when we did this topographic work to now, Fort's Colony has actually gone in their drainage easement along here and improved this entire ditch all the way back to just about in front of these uh, sewer cleanouts that we'll be tying into. Uh, and so basically a majority, you know, half of our site will be directed towards that existing drainage channel uh, that's been stabilized and, you know, is, is there for the purpose of accepting site drainage. This uh, drained to a BMP downstream? So, it, yes, it actually drains to two BMPs. This is up at kind of the, the start of Fort's Colony where it drains down into a pond and then there's a creek that connects this into two more ponds. So these wetlands go right underneath the road into a BMP, into actually another BMP, which I think is all considered one, into another BMP, and then that finally drains out into the wetlands. Um, so in, in addressing the soil concerns, so if, if you look on the soil map, it's considered an AD soil, which is both good and bad. It means that if you were to take it out of the ground and let it dry out, it would most likely be pretty sandy soil, which the soils report indicates. The soils report also indicates what the D part of the AD indicates, which moist is listed in every single category um, within that soils report. Um, so that was why on this lot we did our best, um, as you're aware in the past, you know, we, we do our best to fit all the mitigation on site. Sometimes we're not able to on, on this site. Uh, we made a particular point to reach out to a landscape architect, have that plan completed to ensure that we can make all that mitigation fit on site since we weren't going to be able to do anything from an infiltration uh, side of things. Um, uh, to your point, uh, Mr. Walk, yes, it was, it's, this is section one of Fort's Colony. Uh, so it was platted back in uh, 1974. Um, and Mr. Lukens also to, to kind of address your point with the woods, you know, so the, the back right corner seems like an area where we wouldn't really need to clear and, and that it could potentially be saved. The issue there is we're trying to 
bring that swale around and flatten it out so it's not channel flow going back there, that, that we get as much sheet flow back there as possible, as well as in creating that drainage back there, we need to connect, there's kind of a knoll there and where our contours work in, we need to connect to the other side. So that's why a lot of the heavy um, plantings were placed in, uh, in that back right corner. Uh, I'm happy to answer any questions and also uh, Simon with Olson Fine Homes is here as a representative uh, for the uh, client. They uh, purchased the lot back in 2012 and they uh, currently reside in Connecticut, so could not, could not make it this evening. What's the square, foot, square footage on the house? Just out of curiosity. The, the square footage, the living square footage for this house is 2,200 square feet and it's a, it, for, that does not include the garage. I don't know the garage off the top, but it's a, just a two car, you know, simple garage. I get the only the only other thing I'll mention is um, yes the house is not you know normally we would push it and try and pull it away as far as possible the the lot does slope down so that's why the house is kind of angled so we have it as close as possible on the front right uh, but then we opened it up so that we could have a retaining wall and get a swale there to be able to to direct that water around the residence. We have a number of uh, ports in the uh, retaining wall to to carry runoff. It, yeah, that retaining wall hasn't been designed yet, and it's only about, if I remember correctly, it's only about a foot and a half high. It's not, it's not very, yeah, at its height, it, at its tallest, it's three feet, so it does, it'll have the standard, you know, French drain behind it to be able to release the water. Try to avoid all <laughs> channeling your flow, and so you can disperse the flow below. Correct. Yeah, that's the, the sheet flow. yeah. There's it's just it's basically simply graded at a three to one slope behind there, and it'll just sheet flow down and over. Thank you. Thank you. Questions? Okay. Anyone else like to come forward and speak on this matter? Please state your name and address for record, sir. Good evening. My name is Dan Chambers. I'm at 122 James Bray. So um, I, I, when I'm looking at the um, the plat, it looks like this, the retaining wall, wall that they're proposing, it looks like that is going to be directing the water right towards my house because that's higher than where my house is, and I already have some drainage problems there because when we moved in 22 months ago, we had uh, about three inches of water on, the, on um, the right side of my house, if you're looking at it from the street. And uh, it cost me about almost $4,000 to uh, correct the problem because I had to replace some of the drainage. Um, and uh, that problem seems to be fixed now, but all of that water rolls down to me because I'm the lowest denominator. So that's concerning me, and uh, I, I'm just I'm just suspect that all this clearing is going to cause water to come down and roll right back into that place where I just um, spent money to uh, where it collects. So I, I mean I've I've got I've got some real concerns about where this water is going to go because it doesn't seem like there's it, it's been um, really spelled out co completely where in the where on this uh, the map is your it can show us the relative location of your property um, can, can you show where the where do you have a map of where the houses are Oh, under the label. Yeah, it's right, in, it's right there. His house is directly. All the way to the bottom of the south. What direction that is. Uh, please do. Yeah. So. 
uh, from, from the property line over, none of the water from our site will go to your property. So um, if you look at the contours on our site plan, all of this is going downhill. So this is 69, 68, 67. Water runs perpendicular to all the contours. So from our property line over, we're actually taking, we're probably helping your issue with any water. I don't, looking at our contours, it looks like your issue is probably more in the back, but no water from our site will end up on your property. Well, how can you say that? Because this is, you said this is all going to be cleared, right? And then this it, water, this is all higher than my property here. So and this is higher than this over here. So we're, so this is, that's the point of the retaining wall is due to this slope, we're cutting all of this down. So all of that will now slope towards the retaining wall to lower our site down. So none of this water will drain towards your property. So are you saying that the water is going to be coming down this way or mm -hmm. is it going to be coming this way and this is going to direct it towards my house? So all of this water goes straight down to this swale. This swale is a high point, and then it brings it right around. Members of the board, we're discussing this area right in here. So you'll see that these contours all, this is, uh, I'm pointing at the 69, that's the 68 and the 67. So all of this sheet flows over the retaining wall that we were just discussing, and then this swale will carry the water to the rear, and then this carries it through a swale through our front yard to the Forts Colony drainage easement. Yeah, and this swale, this swale right here, though, that's going to go right down my property line right next to my driveway. So, 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 so we're creating our own swale about seven feet off the property line. So it, so it as part already, of the construction, hmm? as part of the construction, you're gonna develop a swale that carries water. Yeah, 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 so I mean, so we're, we're going to carry all our site water. I mean, it's all flowing to the, you know, there's a region, there's these kind of three channels here. Uh -huh. All of this slopes down into these little ravines. So, you know, we will be direct, the water coming off our roof will be directed to these swales that will be directed through, you know, two new swales, one around from the back to the back and one around to the front to address the concerns. Well, I'm already ex experiencing some erosion right here where this, where you propose that this water is going to come down right down my property line right next to my driveway. That's already, I've already noticed, even though we've been there only 22 months, that there's, there's been erosion that's happened there that, um, that uh, is concerning. We're happy to work with you on that and look at doing some sort of, you know, early, early control to, you know, to ease that control with you. So what assurances do I have as a property owner that if this doesn't work out like you plan it to work out is um, going to be fixed if, it's, if, it, if it doesn't work like you say it is? I don't know that I'm the one to answer that question, but, you know, you're in Forts Colony, so you have Forts Colony as well. Um, but, you know, the, the county will not permit a CO until the drainage has been established. Maybe county staff can, can comment on that, but the county will not grant a CO unless the site plan is in, com or unless the construction is in compliance with our site plan. So if there's site, if there's site water runoff at the time during construction, they'll have to stabilize all of this. They will not get a CO from the county until that's done, and it is in their interest to get a CO from the county. So that's really, I think, the, the best answer I have for you for your concerns is that the site will have to be stabilized and graded per our site plan for them to establish their CO as well as, you know, get their bond money back from the county as well as get their bond money back from Forts Colony. So you have two people looking out in your interest, both Forts Colony and the county, where normally people have just the county. Well, uh, the, um, again, what's concerning me is, is the houses that are, since I am the lowest denominator. If we're uh, lower in, than in you. That, yeah, I know you're lowering because you're in, that's like a crater. Which is another question. Or, which is another question I have is: Are you moving dirt in there to make to make it a, a flatter? So the, uh, there's some dirt on on the backside, but again, the, this entire front area is all a cut. That's why that retaining wall ends up there. So so we are we're we're pulling this slope back as well as then installing a retaining wall to give our house a flat area, and then there's some dirt placed on the backside to be able to flatten out our backside. Um, but again, this is all a cut, so we're lower than you, we're going lower than you, and so the water is not going to go uphill back to you. So we, if anything, we should help give your property some relief from the water. So are you moving dirt into that area, to, or are you just moving dirt, are you bringing dirt I, in, or are you I, just I, moving I've not done in? a volume calculation to know if, if our cut equals our fill. I, I don't know that number off the top of my head. But uh, all I can tell you is, all of our grades are lower than yours, so we are not going to increase your water issue. We are releasing water away and around. 
but the property as it sits now, unless you're going to do some heavy grading, is is higher in places than where uh, on the on the backside it's higher than my property is on but, my driveway. So so I agree, but so right in. Um, I know, right in this portion of the wall, right, just you, to right keep them. You're, right so, you're taking all so, the trees so that's out. about a four foot cut. We're taking that grade and cutting that down about four feet, <laughs> right, just right there alone. And I'm not, I'm not looking at all of these, but that's the 67, 63. So yeah, this is this is all in this area is roughly a four foot cut, and so we're establishing that by peeling this hillside back and then putting the retaining wall in place. So um, this is the 64, you know, the, right along your driveway is the 64, that's a 65 contour. Our swale is down at 62, 62 and a half, and 63. So our swale along all of there is a good two feet or three feet lower than, than the edge of your driveway, which again will release, you know, should any, anything that's keep, I can see right now how if that's a little bit higher, that's keeping that water up there. So all that water will, releasing. So, in conclusion, I, I'm i still against this build because I think it's going to affect my property value. It's, it's obviously going to um, change the, the view, and it's also 100% on RPA, which may or may not mean anything, but this is not just an encroachment on RPA. It's like a total disaster of, I mean, the whole, imp the whole footprint is on RPA. And it's going to affect some wetlands. So, thank you very much. Thank you. Please come forward, state your name and address for the record, please. I'm Kim Orthner. I live at 120 Crail, Williamsburg, Virginia. And so I'm right behind the Chambers house. So that whole retaining wall is at the edge of my property. But I was not sent a letter about this meeting. I heard from the Chambers. So... I don't know what happened, why we weren't informed. But we've lived there 16 years, and I think my biggest concern, because we're up higher, so I'm not worried about the water <laughs> coming into my property, but that green section there, I think you called it a draw, that is wet most of the time. Right now it's dry, and so it doesn't look so bad on those pictures, but we have turtles, and we have you know all kinds of nature back there, and I'm very concerned that you're wiping out this whole section of the wetlands, which, you know, I mean, I feel bad for the people that bought the property that they weren't advised that they were in a wetlands and an RPA, but um, you're let, gonna allow a building in a 100% RPA area, and that whole mitigation he's talking about is gonna change the whole thing. There's another house right behind there um, I'm, I think you should not approve this. Thank you, ma'am. Please, sir. Walter Orthner, uh, 120 Crail, uh, members of the Distinguished uh, Board. Uh, like my wife said, we've been there for 17 years, uh, and now <clears throat> in Ford's Colony, uh, the most difficult lots to build on are being approached by contractors and being built upon. Uh, again, uh, not concerned about the drainage here, but we built, I think, three or four houses in the neighborhood uh, where we live, uh, and most of the contractors clear-cut the entire property, okay? They take out all the trees and, uh, and leave nothing behind. Not to say that this contractor is going to do that, but I'm just looking at the, the three houses that in my neighborhood, they come and they take everything and disturbing the, uh, taking the natural uh, picture out. Uh, so this is an extremely difficult lot to build. And as the uh, uh, expert says, uh, the consistency of the, found, of the, of the uh, soil out there is pretty sandy. Now, of course, they've done their due diligence and come up with reports, but you really have to walk that. I've walked that lot many times on the last 16 years I've been lived there. Uh, many trees have fallen. Because right now, really in the last couple of years, it really has been really dry. If you look where the water on the left side here, where it comes off the uh, James Bray at the end of the cul-de-sac, most of the time, 
that as it, it goes back and it's drained into the natural wetland is underwater. So it's not underwater now, but it will be sometime in the future once the drought is over. So if you, as you move back and you move back towards, as it drains off on the left side towards the road, across the golf course where they have the drains that drain into the, it all works well, but most of the time that piece of land is, is uh, underwater and my wife mentioned it, that we have a lot of big turtle environment over there, but that's the way things are. But uh, it's a very difficult lot. I'm just going you know, to sum up. A very difficult lot to build on. I think the soil is going to require additional foundation requirements. Uh, and then as you move to this lot and to the right and to the back of Crail, that's all natural. The water all comes down there and then pools at the end behind uh, as by the drain on the left. Uh, my just that we don't approve this. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else like to come forward? Uh, Simon Watrous, uh, 223 Woburn. Um, I, I just want to address the neighbors just real fast. Um, my boss, Beverly, has been in the neighborhood 25 years about you know clear cutting for example like we're just not allowed to do that and so there's no I'll tell you, I've lived there for four years right. they're building a lot behind yeah. the construction people who are not there right okay? but we and they take I got to tell you I've seen all out I understand that but we everything. we I mean we have almost ten thousand dollars worth I mean no actually we have well, that is too late. I understand Because that. I've been out there and say, hey, those trees, and oh, oh, that's dented, or that tree needs to come out. Chairman. Gentlemen, gentlemen, please, um, yeah. if we just have you just address the board. Yeah, and, sorry about that. And, and then afterwards, if you'd like to come back up and speak, sir, the, the hearing will still be open. I mean, just to assure the board, we will not clear cut the lot. We have significant financial um, bonds in place to make sure that won't happen. We're ethical, honest builders, so um, that would address that. Um, the homeowners, they live in Connecticut. They've owned this lot since 2012. They've tried to sell this lot multiple times. Obviously, they realize that there's a reason this can't be sold, and so they have decided to retire. Um, I don't have anything else further to say. I think we've done all of our due diligence to the best of our ability. We put the smallest possible house um, that we could. 2,200 square feet on the first floor is pretty small. I don't think we're asking for um, anything too big, um, and so I'll just leave that at, at that. Okay. Thank you. Please, sir. Well, Dorothy, again, I think I maybe used the wrong clear cut. Okay. Most of the lots they clear that I've seen in Red Ber in Berkshire, where they've been you know, over construction over the last uh, seven months, they come in and they take it all. Okay. And I've seen it. I've been out front. Some some trees are actually marked with ribbons on. Uh, and then you come back the next day and they're not. Not to say that this construction person wanted it, but again, the pictures, if we could go back to the pictures on the lot, the trees are in all state of array. Uh, go the next, next one. I mean, you can see, you know, and see this is the edge of the house. The trees, next to the light, please. Uh, and then as a, as, if you look in this, it doesn't, this, uh, here we go with the, yeah, that one. And then there's a ravine, which, okay, I don't know how they're going to, you know, they're going to get in there, bulldoze all those trees. And if you look that drop, that's about a six foot drop by that, that, that uh, uh, far red uh, marker. So they're going to have to either, I don't know how they're going to be able to level a lot without bringing in additional soil. But again, I'll leave that to construction experts. I'm just telling you, I've walked this piece many times. It's a very, this doesn't do justice, these pictures, to how difficult this lot with this ravine in it. And that ravine drains all the way down to the wet areas. So you're going to be disturbing and, re, and so all that water will be, have to, will, will actually, like you said, will be draining that way. But you're going to have to have some soil here and maybe some increased foundation requirements so the house doesn't sink. Uh, so, but. I only can tell you about the way they clear lots, uh, and you can go over in my neighborhood right now, and they're clearing a lot. There's not many trees left. Thank you. 
Anyone else who'd like to speak on this matter? Okay, we'll close the public hearing and open the board discussions. Forest Colony. Mr. Chairman, I'd just like to make a statement that we've made at other hearings um, for the public that's taken the time to be here tonight. Um, <clears throat> The charge of the board was read at the beginning of the meeting. It's challenging on residual lots um, where we're trying to balance property issues with the spirit and intent of the, the code of the county. Um, oftentimes, we're trying to hit that balance by reducing runoff, going to the resource, making sure that it's not sediment laden, uh, and taking you know, if infiltration works, that's sometimes an option to help deal with uh, the stormwater that runs off post-construction. Um, and, and it's a difficult balancing act. But I just wanted to make you aware of that because this is an ongoing issue. We see it at every meeting um, for these lots that were platted years ago before the Chesapeake Bay Act. Um, and then in Ford's Colony in particular, it was developed at a time when wetland delineation requirements were not as strict as they are today. And so the limits of wetlands weren't as clearly defined at that time. So statement for your general knowledge. It's, this is a recurring issue for us. Responsible development of these remaining lots is, uh, is extremely challenging. Um, it's, difficult to, it's, it's difficult to deny somebody the use of their property when the adjoining landowners have had the opportunities to develop their properties um, at the same time you know we we're charged with preserving the public commons for the posterity and so you know, making making these decisions to um, you know as the Army Corps of Engineer if I heard that correctly the Army Corps of Engineers already approved the the wetlands um, we impacted by this it's a 2200 square foot house for Ford's colony that's pretty small that looks like they really tried to minimize the impact um, things we normally see where we want to pull pull it forward work on the drainage they've uh, been in front of us many times so he knows the questions we were we were going to ask and I see that you know they've done the best that they can do with this lot Sorry, sir, but the, the public hearing is closed. Another thing, um, looking at you, you gentlemen, and I can sympathize with the people here that uh, have a problem with this. <clears throat> it was uh, plotted before all of this was restrictions was put in place, and contractors that you hire to do clearing and it all depends on who you hire and who's looking after the job depends on what kind of a job you get and uh, sometimes they just get the lowest bidder and they just go in there and basically clear cut everything in there just like the gentleman says this job right here, if, if it goes, it needs to be looked after. And if there are canopy trees and things that need to be, they need to be marked. And somebody needs to look after the job to make sure that it goes down the way that it should be. As far as your depths of uh, six foot elevation depths, uh, when you build a house, uh, James City County requires uh, your soil testing to make sure that you've got the right footing and whether it, how deep it is and the soil test, everything, so it doesn't uh, sink, the soil shrinks well or whatever. But you, you need to have somebody doing this project that knows what they're doing instead of just going in and clearing out everything. I think the house could be built on this that's only a 2,200 square foot house. It's not a very big house. 
and it sounds like to me that the drainage situation has been uh, discussed and, and it looks like the elevations that I see here that it will drain. Um, they've done a pretty good job, the engineering firms on the ones previous that I've seen done that it, the water usually falls where they say it's going to go. If not, they're going to be responsible for it. But uh, all in all is that the lot needs to be cleared according to the plans instead of just going in there and just ripping out everything and uh, causing a problem. So. In this area to the south and east, partic in particular, we've already got, you know, engineered solutions across to the south, wetlands area, west where. Fundamentally, a data point to work for. Any other comments for the board? Any points of discussion? I think I, uh, you know, initially missed the idea of, of building in the area our last meeting option within what decision per se the lot is 100 percent with Anyways, this is a uh, <coughs> Mr. Rodley, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but Forge Colony is essentially a giant ditching project that was, you know, they've got all these BMPs that they funnel the water down into. They were part of a natural system at one point that they um, converted into BMPs. Back when this was developed, most of this project was approved using nationwide permits, 26, uh -huh. and you could impact up to 10 acres of wetlands under nationwide 26 back then. Um, so a lot of it was done uh, section by section and under that authorization it just there wasn't the level of detail back then that there is today um, so you run into run into these these issues of course Chesapeake Bay Act was passed in uh, 1990 after this was platted so um, layer upon layer of complication over time but that's Partly why all these lots remain is because of the complications over time. Um, they're tough lots. Yep. All right. Okay. I will make a motion to adopt the resolution to grant the exception request for Chesapeake Bay Board Case Number CBPA TAC 22 TAC 0105. 124 James Bray Drive. Motion is to adopt. Mr. Rodley? No. To Waltrip? Yes. Mr. Lukens? Yes. Mr. Dunn? Yes. Motion passes.
Okay, that concludes our public hearings for tonight. Board considerations, we have CBPA Tech 21 Tech 0178 5508 Swan Road. Extension requests. Chairman, members of the board, Robin Benedict, Watershed Planner. Mr. Jason Hoyle is requesting a one-year extension to CBPA 21-0178, originally granted on January 12th, 2022. Staff concurs with this request with the stipulation that all permit conditions except for the expiration date be reauthorized and that the new date of expiration is January 12th, 2024. We just need a motion to grant the request. Yes. Don't move. <laughs> okay, thank you, Ms. Benedict. I think we have one. Hold on. We have a motion to adopt the, or <laughs> to adopt the uh, extension request. Mr. Roadley? Yes. Mr. Waltrip? Yes. Mr. Lukens? Yes. Mr. Dunn? Yes. Thank you. Motion passes. Okay, and then the last board consideration, we need election of officers, is that for? Yes, uh, good afternoon, board. Um, as many of you know, um, Mr. Gusman uh, did, did not wish to be reappointed um, and uh, has therefore left a vacancy as a, for a chair. Um, in the meantime, uh, or for the purpose of this meeting, uh, Mr. Dunn as the vice chair, took over the responsibility and roles as the chair. However, um, looking forward, we do need to fill the chair's position. Normally, our election of officers is in November. That will still occur this year, so this is, at a minimum, a holdover until then, essentially. Uh, so, Mr. Dunn, would you I'd care like to, to nominate Mr. Rodley <laughs> no. as the chairman for the Chesapeake Bay Board? <laughs> Can I get a second on uh, that motion? Oh, I see a nod from Mr. Waltrip. So shall we vote? Hold on, I don't think I heard Mr. Rodley accept. <laughs> um, would you consider taking it on until the November election? This might become a possessions nine-tenths of the law type of thing <laughs> in November, if I'm not present, so I, I will, I will, Holt, I will continue as the chairman for the Chesapeake Bay Board until November. Thank you, Mr. Dunn. We, 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 we need to vote on that. <laughs> um, the other two get a say. <laughs> um, would anybody like to second that? Larry, I'll would you like to say, okay, I, I didn't hear you, I'm sorry. Excuse me, I second. Um, Mr. Rodley? Yes. Mr. Waltrip? Yes. Mr. Lukens? Mr. Dunn. No. <laughs> Motion passes. You're doing a fine job. Thank you, Howie. Thank you. Congratulations. Um, I believe there now needs to be a vice chair vote, um, as I don't believe you can be both the chair and the vice chair. True. I'll nominate Mr. Rodley as the. I will accept the nomination for vice chair. We need a second, please. I second that. Mr. Roadley. Yes. Mr. Waltrip. Yes. Mr. Lukens. Yes. Mr. Dunn. Yes. Thank you. And I think that's all the matters. Special consideration. Mr. Motion to adjourn. Mr. Oh. Chairman, just, just a point so that everyone's aware. Um, I've tendered a resignation um, officially effective in October, though I'll be sitting through the number meeting. Mr. Lukens has offered up, uh, tendered his resignation. He is moving out of state. Um, <clears throat> his term, along with uh, yours, Mr. Dunn, and yours, Mr. Roadley, expire October 1 of this year. Um, <clears throat> not so fast, my friend. Well played. <laughs> um, we, will, we are in discussions with the attorney's office on how to get those... Um, appointments uh, made before the Board of Supervisors, um, hopefully in that they're in their December meeting. Uh, Mr. Lukens has offered to sit uh, for the next two meetings. 
um, for the October and November meetings. Um, I believe you will not be here for Christmas. Is that correct? So, um, and the way the way um, things work, and I can be corrected here uh, by my right hand man, uh, is if until you're uh, reappointed by the board, you are effectively still on this board. <clears throat> so, congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. Unless uh, that is you don't wish to be reappointed, in which case we'll have a conversation offline. Okay. Done. If there's no other. Motion to adjourn.